So it's a really, really lovely day today and I thought I would come outside and film in the garden for the first time of summer 2018. And um, it felt like an appropriate place to make this video, even though I was actually planning to make a completely different video today and put this one off for a while. I feel like while I'm sitting in Dog Dog's garden and usually I'd be like, here's my little buddy, here's my little buddy. And uh, that's never going to happen again on this channel. Oh, sorry, the birds are super loud. I hope you can hear me. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you will know this already by the time you see this video. But if not, I'm afraid Dog Dog passed away um, a week and two days ago now. It was Thursday the 26th he died um, and he was put to sleep. So I thought I would sort of give you a bit of a story about what happened since you guys have known Dog Dog for like four years or more that he's been, you know, frequently popping in and out of videos and grumbling Anna and he was an amazing dog and videos in the garden aren't the same without a little kind of cameo dog dog. <laughs> um, but I also wanted to just tell people what it's actually like to have your pet euthanized because it was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. I mean, beyond anything I have ever experienced, <laughs> tripping on acid or anything, watching your best friend in the world who you've known for 15 years go from themselves to gone uh, and the process of them dying, it's so weird. So I want to just tell you what it's like, that it's in some ways it's more horrible and in some ways it's less horrible than you'd imagine. So to kind of rewind and actually explain what led to him being euthanized, he was 16 and a half years old. We'd had him for 15 of those years. He was a rescue dog. Um, so obviously 16 and a half years old, he was ancient. He had quite a lot of health problems. Um, his mobility especially was getting worse and worse. Like he'd had arthritis for years. He was still actually managing to get in and out of the dog flap, albeit very slowly, like his front half would come in when you were in the kitchen and, you know, he'd stand there kind of smiling at you like Pooh Bear stuck in the door <laughs> and, um, and I'd be like, you coming in? He'd be like, yeah, in a minute, in a minute, give me a minute. And, uh, and then he'd eventually get his back legs through. So his mobility had been getting worse and worse. He was sleeping very, very deeply. You would often think he was dead when you saw him sleeping. And because of all of this, I just had a feeling that his time was coming. I really, I knew that he wasn't going to be around much longer, which is exactly what I said in the last, in the last vlog I filmed with him, that that was filmed only about four or five days before he died. Um, and as I said in that vlog, I don't think he's going to be around forever. Obviously he's very old and I want to film as much of him as I can before he goes. Um, and I'm so glad that I made that vlog and that I did film him, that I got some really nice smiley pictures of him while he was still okay because yeah, it was so soon after that, that it all went to shit. Um, so basically what happened, it was on the Tuesday night, he was put down on the Thursday and on the Tuesday night, everything had been fine, normal. I went to the supermarket at about 11 30 12 at night I do go there quite late it's quieter um and fortunately instead of walking straight out of the door I put my trench coat on and went oh my god I've got so much crap in my pockets so I walked down to the kitchen instead and started emptying all these tissues and shopping lists out of my pockets and while I was there I thought I heard this slight whimper but it was so faint I was like uh, maybe it was a bird or something um, but then I started hearing him panting in there. He was definitely in there and he was panting and it wasn't a normal pant. It was like a distressed pant. So I immediately went in there and it looked as though he'd slipped in the kitchen. And he, he did used to slip in the kitchen quite a lot because it's the only floor we've got that isn't carpet. Um, and his back legs had splayed out like this and he clearly couldn't get up. Um, and he, he looked quite distressed about it all. So I went and kind of lifted him up onto his legs and he weighed 20 kilograms, so he was quite a big dog. Um, I lifted him up and I kind of like wobble walked him onto the carpet where he'd have some purchase. Um, and he seemed fine then, he was walking, he was okay. He seemed like quite shaken up obviously. So I stayed with him for a while and I fed him until he seemed a little bit calmer. Um, and then I went to the supermarket, did my thing, came back. And everything basically seemed fine until like I went to bed at about three o'clock in the morning and everything was normal, I thought. Um, and then in the morning, it turned out that actually he had lost the ability to 
like move between standing and sitting. He couldn't get up and he couldn't go down. So the only thing you could do was to lift him onto his legs, at which point he could walk just fine. And then when you wanted him to sit down, you had to physically kind of lift him and force him backwards and get him in this funny sort of squashed position with his back legs, which didn't look comfortable, but it was as comfortable as you could make him. Anyway, I was dealing with that all day. We'd booked a vet appointment for seven o'clock at night when my mum was gonna be back from work and everything. And um, I pretty much knew at that point, okay, he's gonna have to be put down. And I was actually dreading more the idea that the vets might say, hey, let's just try stronger painkillers. Let's just extend his life and see if he gets better because I just knew it innately that it was the end and that there was nothing we could do and that he wasn't happy and that prolonging his suffering was gonna make it awful. Um, and unfortunately that is exactly what happened because we got to the vets at seven. I'd taken him there with my stepdad. So I'd been the one to like lift him into the car, to sit in the back with him, holding him upright because my stepdad is a really jerky driver due to his hand controls. And uh, he was like wobbling around and we could only get Presley in the footwell and it was just, just a shitty journey. Um, and Presley, we got him in the vets and he'd been standing up and he, you know, because he couldn't sit down anymore and he didn't, he seemed quite reluctant for me to put him down. So he'd been standing and walking for so long by the time we saw the vets. Like normally, you know, he wouldn't stand up anymore for more than about like two minutes. Um, and it must have just been really, really strenuous for him. And I'd seen all of this all day, so I knew how bad he was. My mum, on the other hand, gets back from work and Pilates and all of that. She sees the dog standing up, walking on his own, wagging his tail, because, you know, he was a lovely, happy dog. And I'm standing there saying, I think it needs to be the end. It's game over. His back legs don't work. He can't move on his own. It's got to be game over. And my mum was all like, well, he's smiling and his tail's wagging. And no, we've, we've got to see. And um, so... Yeah, my worst fears came true. We we got stronger painkillers. And I got really pissed off at the vets because I had, I'd essentially resigned myself to walking into the vets with a dog and walking out with an empty collar. And now they were telling me, yeah, here's some false hope that I knew was false hope. And you know, you're probably gonna end up coming back in two days and the dog's gonna be in agony and that's gonna be his last memories. So I'd said to my mom, my stepdad, I said, look, if you are going to do this, I do not want anything to do with the consequences. Whatever happens, it is on you and I don't want anything to do with it. My stepdad's like, oh my God, you're going to be emotional. And I was like, well, of course I'm being emotional. I've had this dog for 15 years and, uh, and um, yeah, so he, he starts shouting over me. I just, I just walked out of the vets. I was like, the dog's fine. He's got them twos to get him home. I can't be fucking dealing with this. So I just went home and got stoned. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so in the end they came back and yeah, we had some gabapentin, which is like a really hardcore painkiller. Um, my parents got home, they gave the dog some drugs, checked that I'd fed him, which I had, um, and then they just pissed off out for the night. Like, oh yeah, never mind that the dog is crippled and can't move a, like a fucking inch on his own. We've plonked him on his ass and we're going out for the night. Um, and, uh, you know, so obviously I went down to be with Presley and um, the gabapentin initially made him quite sleepy and quite chilled out. And I was thinking, well, OK, I don't think this is going to fix him, but he'll probably just be in a bit of a haze for a few days. And eventually, you know, my parents will realise this is a bad idea. And, you know, I guess I'll just take this as some extra time with him and I'll try and make it as comfortable as I can. Um, so anyway, he went to sleep after a while. I'd been massaging his head and he went to sleep. So I went up to do some writing and the next thing I know, my parents have come home and they're hollering at me because the dog has gone into the garden. They've taken him outside to go to the bathroom. And, uh, you know, my mom having not seen the dog, she assumes she can just put a lead on him, take him out, out here. Um, he'll do a wee and then he'll jump back in the house and go and lie down again. The dog naturally had gotten out into the garden. She lifted him up, got him out into the garden, and then he had collapsed, force blade, just pfft, and um, she couldn't lift him up. She couldn't lift him up. My stepdad couldn't lift him up. He was stuck on the floor and nobody could move him. So I came down, I managed to get him up and I had to lift him right up the step because she'd taken him out of the wrong door. Um, you know, he could barely get up little steps, let alone one this big. 
and uh you know and i'm i'm thinking nothing of this because i'd seen it all day so i got him back in the house lay him down you know gave him some water and everything made sure he was comfortable but my mum was really freaked out by it this was the first time she'd actually realized how bad it was so she was really upset and she said i'm sorry we made the wrong decision uh he does he he, we, he can't live like this you know he can't um phone the vets tomorrow as soon as soon as they open try and book an appointment for the evening when I get home from work, phone me as soon as you know. Um, and so, you know, it was agreed that the next day was going to be the last day of his life. Um, but then again, my parents, on having made sure that he, you know, well, he hadn't gone to the bathroom, actually he'd gone outside and collapsed in a heap and not gone to the bathroom. But, you know, she'd seen me give him some water and all of that. And they just piss off to bed because, yeah, a dog that can't move an inch is definitely going to be fine for eight hours. Ew. Um, he did have a little snooze for about half an hour and then I heard him screaming in pain. I mean, not just like a little kind of... It was literally screaming in pain. Nobody else had woken up, so I'm legging it down the stairs and I'm like trying to shout to him to tell him I'm coming, but he's deaf. He can't hear. He hasn't been able to hear for years. Um, so I'm just running as fast as I can to get down to the hallway where he was. As soon as he saw me, he calmed down, stopped screaming. So I think it was more panic than pain because he was halfway up, halfway down, his back legs stuck. Um, and he was sitting in his own poo, which was just so humiliating and awful for him because he was such a clean dog. And um, so I managed to like haul him up out of the poo. He'd somehow managed to poo on newspaper, which he'd never been trained to do, but he'd done it. Such a good dog. He was so amazing. So I took away the poo in case he was just like worried about it or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, he seemed to want to stay standing for a bit. So I, I let him stand for a bit and tried to calm him down, but he was just so shaken up by the whole thing. Um, so I gave him lots of food. He still had a great appetite and that seemed to be about the only pleasure he could have anymore. So I gave him like an extra meal um, and eventually parked him back down on his bum, but I knew I couldn't leave him the rest of the night. Um, you know, because I wouldn't hear him up in my room. If I went to bed, I wouldn't hear him. Nobody else had heard that, so they weren't going to hear him either. And it was pretty clear that I was going to have to phone the vets as soon as they opened and get him put down ASAP. So I spent the night on the floor next to him and I didn't sleep and he didn't sleep. So it was about four hours of that um, before my mum got up and she got a right fucking talking to from me because I'd had four hours of sitting there stewing in absolute fury about this is exactly what I didn't want, this is exactly what I knew was going to happen, why the fuck did you think he was going to be fine all night? And I told you if you do this it is your responsibility but no it was always going to be me and the dog who were going to be the ones who had to deal with it. Like why did you extend his life when you were just going to go out anyway and then go to bed? What was the point? You just extended his life to leave him alone in pain, sitting in his own shit and etc. So yeah, I was pretty fucking fuming. Um, I got her to sit with him for a little bit. She decided to take the day off work eventually. Um, so I kind of took a break, tried to get like 20 minutes sleep, couldn't noisy helicopter. I phoned the vets as soon as they opened at 8 and uh, the soonest they could come was noon because we decided we wanted a home euthanasia now um, so we didn't have to get him back to the vets because the vets the night before oh my god just the looks you get off people when you come in with this dog who is clearly dying. The receptionist was like is that Presley? Does he want some water? And all these other people with their healthy dogs, they're like looking at you going, oh, does he have heart failure? Oh, it's so sad. And you just get all of this. And I didn't want him to die on the floor of the vets around the smell of like antiseptic and fear. And I, I didn't want that. You know, we'd already almost put him through that. And, um, you know, as far as I was concerned, this, this mistake had been my parents and, you know, they admitted to that openly and therefore they were quite happy to pay for the extra money for it to be a home euthanasia, which I do recommend, like really, if you can possibly afford it. And there's actually time, obviously, if it's an emergency, you're going to have to go with whatever you can go with. But because he was basically comfortable, we'd given him some more painkillers and he was basically comfortable, we could wait to noon. And it was actually about half one that they got here in the end. They did phone us to keep us updated to say that they were going to be a bit late. Um, but we got like a nice long half a day saying goodbye to him. So his final day, he had me, like I didn't leave him at all. My mum was mostly around kind of popping in and out. 
um, and we were often just sitting with him just talking about anything apart from the euthanasia just talking about complete bollocks because we didn't want to think about it um, obviously when I was on my own with him it was kind of impossible not to think about it but you know and how do you say goodbye to a dog like I think if it's a human and you get to say goodbye it's going to be a good thing there's you know all barriers are broken down anything you ever wanted or needed to say to them you say it but with a dog you know you can say goodbye to them you can hug them you can do everything but it's they don't know what's going on and there's I don't know there's no real closure I guess in the same way as a human saying like oh I forgive you for whatever oh I love you oh this was a really good memory or something there's, you can't really have that with a dog um but anyway yeah he still had his appetite so he got two or three meals um i gave him a packet of chicken then grilled about three rashers of bacon because he fucking loved bacon so he got his own plate of bacon i even let him lick the plate because my mom wasn't watching <laughs> and um he enjoyed that then i gave him every treat that i had which wasn't many i had like a bag of treats and i was like well it's not much use having them in a couple hours so here you go, eat him, eat him, eat him, um, because he had been on a special diet for a long time because of his kidneys, um, so he wasn't allowed that much protein, so all of this like bacon and stuff he wasn't really allowed, but doesn't matter now. So I gave him that and I moved him back into the living room and opened the door because it was quite a nice day so he could smell the smells and uh, so he was sitting in the living room with me looking out, um, looking out at the garden with sort of all the grass blowing and his nose kind of twitching when the smells drifted in and he seemed pretty content in all. He was, he was okay. You did get this feeling though that you know he knew he knew that he couldn't get up and down anymore and he knew that it wasn't right and you did get this kind of resigned sense of mm, from him a little bit but so long as people were around him and like say I didn't leave him at all um and I've got some pictures that I took that I took and that my mum took um just about two hours before he was put down. I didn't think I'd take any pictures that day, but like when he was looking smiley, I took some pictures of him. Um, and yeah, the vets came and uh, my mom had been talking to me earlier on about how our cat was put down many years ago. I didn't go to witness that one, so I'd never witnessed euthanasia before. And she was saying that she was actually very shocked at how quickly the cat just went and fell asleep and died she had assumed that you know it would be slow it would be a slow process that she'd be stroking the cat the cat would slowly go to sleep and that would be it so she hadn't really said her goodbyes you know they put the needle in the cat went Pfft. and she'd assumed that it was just because our cat tessa was very small and very old when she died and she must have just been really ready to go um but I, you know, I had my own theories being slightly more medically aware than my mum is. So when the vets got here and started bringing out the kit, I started asking them questions. I was like, well, how many injections is it? Is it one or is it two? Like, you know, cause human lethal injections, I think it's three injections or three separate drugs. There's like a sedative, a paralytic, and then the killing drug. Whereas um, with animal euthanasia, it's just one, one injection so i asked her is it intravenous or is it intramuscular and she said well we shave a little a little patch on their leg and i was like intravenous <laughs> obviously you know having a history as a heroin addict i know exactly what this means that if it had been you know an intramuscular shot in the back of his neck sort of in the scruff of his neck that would have taken probably a few minutes but if it's an intravenous one you know in the vein which they usually do in a dog's leg sort of here um it is gonna it's gonna hit them like a ton of bricks so i knew the minute she puts that that needle in like that is final goodbye time so we all sort of arranged ourselves around him i was sit he was sort of here and i was here the vet was right there there was another vet behind him my mom was sat there so i sort of had this this view of of his face and his leg um he kind of went a bit when the needle went in but he wasn't he wasn't bothered by it he wasn't upset by it um and he wasn't actually upset by the vets either because they were visiting him in his house he'd never had that with a vet before so he just thought they were nice people who liked him and you know they were all stroking him and he was like hey this is fun um you know so he was he was still wagging his tail and he was still smiling um and yeah the the needle went in and it was like this blue liquid it was, there was quite a lot of it, it was about this much blue liquid um, and I saw the blood blossom in the syringe, which is what you do to check that you've hit a vein. If 
air comes in you're not in the vein but if blood comes in you are so she hit the vein in one try and as soon as I saw that I knew right he's going immediately so I kissed him on the head and she started pushing the plunger down um, and he just his head just sort of crumpled sideways onto me um, his eyes were still open and um, she pushed half of the syringe down quite quickly and he'd gone flop uh, and then she pushed the rest down and I heard the syringe kind of go when it emptied she then put her finger on his neck um, and pretty much immediately said he's gone um, and I you know I kept stroking him for quite a long time because you don't actually know how long it takes between the last heartbeat before their consciousness is gone a lot of people say to keep speaking to your animal that hearing is going to be the last sense that goes but Presley was so deaf anyway um, and I think we were all just too choked up to talk to be honest um, both me and my mom were just in floods of tears um, when that was happening uh, yeah and um, he was sort of flopped over I tried to close his eye it wouldn't close um, it's, you know in movies they just go and it stays closed but actually with a real freshly dead animal um, it's quite springy and it just springs back open but yeah it was it was really weird that I I had gotten quite used to the idea of okay I'm gonna have a dog and then I'm not gonna have a dog but there was this weird in-between stage where I still had a dog the dog was still there but he was dead and we just killed him and I, I had this horrible sense of wrongness even though I knew it was the only thing we could have done there was no way we could have kept him going he would have ended up so unhappy and so crippled and in so much pain and I didn't want to ever hear him scream the way he'd been screaming in the night it was the right thing to do but I still felt horrible about the fact that I had signed my name on a bit of paper and basically just killed my dog uh, my dog had gone from wagging his tail and suddenly he was dead and I was like well did he want to be dead like is he floating around the room going what the fuck did you just do to me like feeling really betrayed or something I don't know um you know and I've I've touched dead animals before but they've always been really dead you know there's been hamsters there's been the cat we found just over there under the hedge and they've always been dead and stiff and cold and solidified and they don't feel like animals and you know you know innately that that it's dead that there's nothing there and you know when we went to identify our cat once who also went out and died under someone's hedge we had to ID him at the vets and um, I almost didn't know that it was him even though know, we'd had him for 19 years but dead and flat he looked so different I, I, I felt no attachment whatsoever to that body because it wasn't him whereas with Presley you know he died two seconds ago and his body was still completely warm everything was flexible and soft and he still felt completely like him and there was a sense of attachment to that body that I almost didn't want them to take it away uh like I'd, I'd always thought that I would want his ashes I thought I really did want his ashes but as soon as he got sick as soon as like his death was on the table essentially um I knew that I didn't want his ashes I just thought what is the point what on earth is the point I don't think I'm going to feel any kind of spiritual or emotional help from having this jar of dog dust sitting on my shelf um, so in the end we we let the body go to the vets just to be cremated with the other animals um, I kept I'd kept this <laughs> this ball of fluff because I'd been using his grooming mitt quite a lot while he was like ill and I'd been with him for like all day and all night and all day so I have this ball about this big of his fluff um, since you can make kind of memorial diamonds you can make ashes and hair into diamonds which I would like to do one day but it costs about a thousand pounds so it's not going to be anytime soon but I wanted a piece of him somehow so yeah pretty quickly I suppose it was maybe about five minutes later that they took his body like I just kept stroking him the whole time because I wanted to make sure that he wasn't kind of left alone until he was definitely out of his body um, and you know and then they and we you know we'd started just trying to kind of like not think about it we'd started discussing the practicalities with the vet about oh you know we've got some of this special renal diet food do you want it back so they they actually took back 30 pounds worth of food off us that cut the bill down quite a lot um my mom was you know saying oh we're going to throw out his bed because he'd been in his bed 
when he died and the vets had scooped up his body, put it into a plastic bed, wrapped it in a blanket and taken it out to their car. And I couldn't bear to let his bed go. We've still got his bed because um, it, it smells of him and it's his bed and it's always been his bed, I think, or certainly for most of his life. And it's, he died on it and he lived on it and it was, I don't know, it's probably the most attached to him thing there is. So I don't know when or if I'll be able to get rid of that, which is stupid because it's a huge bed. Um, the main thing I wanted was his collar. Um, I kept his collar which has got his name tag on that he always had and that it did smell of him initially and I spent quite a long time just sitting there crying and holding it and uh, just smelling it because it smelled like him and I guess that was basically it I've talked for a very long time but I suppose I should get on to the kind of grief bit too that I I didn't know what to expect really um he was the, like definitely the pet we've had that I've been the closest to um, you know, he's been my dog, really. Uh, we got him when I was 18, when I first moved back home, and I was very, very anorexic, and um, he was sort of one of the things that I stayed alive for during that period. Um, you know, and then he was such a huge part of my life. Like, I've never really been an adult without Presley. You know, that we got him a few months, like maybe two months after my 18th birthday, and he died a few days after my 33rd birthday. So that's like a long period of time. That's a big chunk of my life to, you know, that's almost half my life really, it feels like to have had him. And, uh, and it is weird. Um, the, there was this, this um, oh God, my foot's gone to sleep. I've been sitting in this crazy position for ages. There was this really like anxious feeling to the grief that it wasn't just sadness. It wasn't just sort of crying your eyes out sadness like I've had when friends have died. There was also this like mad sense of anxiety that I think you only get when it's somebody you see a lot, who you see every day, and somebody you really rely on for anything, whether that's financially, emotionally, um, you know, and you do rely on a dog for a lot of things when they're like totally your best friend and you're quite isolated by illness and by where you live and by, you know, a few of your friends turning into complete dickheads over the last year. And Presley was just always there and he got better and better with age. He was such a sweet old dude. I was so used to every time I went downstairs for a drink or a snack, like Presley would be there and I'd kind of just lie down and hug him for a bit and talk about stuff. Um, and it, it did feel like this, this enormous safety net in my life had sort of gone. And I think it was mostly because I was very sleep deprived because I hadn't slept at all um, the night before and I was just really sleep deprived and really emotional and it was horrible. Um, and by the next day, by the time I'd slept, I slept for like 13 straight hours and then it seemed a bit more manageable. Um, but yeah, I spent a lot of time at night when everyone else had gone to bed just sort of wandering around. And, uh, and sitting where he would sit and I would actually kind of reach my hand out and sort of be stroking the air because it, it so felt like there was this presence of him there. I could still feel this, this kind of like memory shadow there of him. Um, and about, I think it was about two days after he died that I went downstairs and I'd been sitting in the hallway where he always sat, where I'd always see him late at night. And then I'd gone in to sort of see his bed and smell his bed and kind of just get the smell of him. Um, and then I sort of walked over to the exact spot where he died. And it was like, I had this weird sense that his presence was, was still there, but it grew. It stopped being this dog-sized, dog-shaped presence and it just grew to, to fill the room. It was bigger than the room and it wasn't behind me or in front of me, it was just all around me. And it felt very Presley, but not so fun-loving, not so interactive. It was quite passive, but it was a very warm, loving presence. And it just filled that room and it, it sort of came with me around everywhere I went that night. You know, I just felt it with me. Um, and I don't feel that so much now. I feel like maybe that was his last little lingering, hey, I'm here. Um, and, you know, it's it's not so upsetting now. Now that it's been a week and a couple of days, um, 
it feels more unreal i think i think that's why it's not so upsetting that you know it's very real when you witness it happening when it's euthanasia and it happens it's very real and then a few days later it just it just feels like it doesn't feel like he's gone forever it just feels like he's not present um if that makes any sense but yeah the weird thing was that actually about five days round about the time i filmed the last vlog when i was thinking he's not got long left my mom actually started talking to me in the kitchen and talking about how deep presley slept and how she often had to poke him to make sure he was still alive um and I was saying, well, yeah, I don't think he's got long left either. And actually, if he is going to go, I would much prefer that it was like that. I would rather get up in the morning and just find him gone, sleeping peacefully in his bed. I really don't want to have to have him put down. I think it would be so upsetting. I don't think I would be able to deal with it. And my mum completely agreed. She was like, yeah, you know, and she was talking about how the cat died and things. And my stepdad was just going, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I'm having nothing to do with it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was kind of ironic that, yeah, we'd just been saying, oh, my God, I would never be able to cope with having him put down. And, like, five days later, that's exactly what we have to go and get done. The comfort we can take is that his last day was a nice one and that he, while he clearly knew on some level that this couldn't go on, he was... He was in a pretty decent place mentally when he went out, so that was good. Um, so I guess there's not much else to say, really. Um, I am planning to join Borrow My Doggy so that I can like meet some dogs locally and take them for walks and things, um, get to know some other kind of doggy personalities um, until we're ready to get one of our own which I hope will happen sometime in, in the next year that we'll have another dog because it is, it is weird. It's weird having a house with no pets because we have, we have nothing now. My mom really wants a cat, so, and I really want a dog. I'm a dog person through and through. I like cats, but I want a dog. Um, and uh, so we'll have, to, we'll have to get a cat and a dog that will get along together, which could be difficult and could take a long time. Um, so I think borrowing my doggy will be good, it will give me some exercise and some routine and I'll be able to kind of get out and meet dogs that aren't Presley because, you know, he's really been, he's not just a dog to me, he's the dog, the essence of doggishness. Um, and I think if I was to get a dog right now, it would, it would be a bit weird. It would just be, you're not Presley, Presley didn't do that, you're not doing it right. Like, its habits would obviously be different and it it would just feel like it wasn't right and it wasn't enough i don't i don't want to have a dog if it's going to feel second best so yeah get to know lots of dogs get to know who i you know what kind of dog i could i could befriend next and um yeah so that's the plan i think at the end of this video i might put some little video clips of him um, I'll probably start with a clip that I recorded, which I've, you'll have seen on Instagram anyway, but I recorded a clip of him the night before he was put down. This was just after he got back from the vets and they'd put him on the gabapentin and I'd been really like worried and furious with my parents and I thought it was going to be a shit decision, but there was like this brief moment of Presley actually being really happy and really himself. So I'll probably put that up first and then I'll just give you a scatter shot of clips and clips and photos and things like that. My battery is dying. I have to end this video here, but yeah, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings. I think we all love Presley. He was the best dog in the world. So yeah, nothing else to say. Bye-bye. Hey buddy. Hello. Oh, look, I untucked his tail. He's been sitting on his tail all day and I've untucked him now and he can wag again. And it's so much nicer. He actually looks like a living dog now instead of a potato. But his legs, like, you see him from the top and he's just, you know, that's how, that's the only way you can sit now. Um, but you're on so many drugs that it's probably fine, huh? Yeah? Thumbs up for drugs? Yeah. <laughs> Look at this munted cunt's face. <laughs> I feel decidedly less pessimistic about it now that he seems quite jolly, so yay. Smile! <laughs> Are you going to grumble? Are you going to do a grumble? <laughs> Yes, that's better. That's better. You got your grumble back. Oh, we like it when you're grumpy. That's how you really are, isn't it, huh? All polite and shy like you were earlier. That's not who you are. Grumble? Oh. Yes. <laughs>